This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday morning. Um, I want to welcome everybody to another edition of uh, uh, Journal Club for our Friday morning fellows conference. We have two presenters this morning. Our first presenter is going to be Dr. John Chen. John is a third year fellow in the clinical track, did his residency here at Emory, and will be headed off to Seattle to Swedish Medical Center next year to be a cardiologist, not surprisingly. Um, and he is going to present the avatar trial. Sort of our theme today is aortic valve disease and treatment there, thereof. Um, uh, so he will be presenting first and Akanksha Agrawal will be presenting second. So John, take it away. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, so Akanksha and I are uh, talking about aortic uh, stenosis today. Um, so I'll be talking about the avatar trial. Uh, so this is a study that um, was published this month, actually, um, and it's looking at aortic valve replacement versus uh, conservative treatment in people with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. So um, I'll, I'll start by just going over the guidelines real quick for uh, aortic stenosis. I'll talk about a previous trial that was published uh, for asymptomatic severe AS. And then I'll delve into the AVATAR trial. And then at the end, I'll mention a few trials that are um, coming down the pipeline. So, uh, you know, our current guidelines, the main indication for um, uh, AVR in aortic stenosis is severe symptomatic AS. So, you know, adults with severe high grading AS, symptoms of exertional dyspnea, heart failure, angina, syncope or presyncope by history or exercise testing. Uh, AVR is indicated in those patients, class one indication. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's um, a couple other class one indications for people with severe asymptomatic AS, um, and that's when the LVF drops below 50% or um, the patient is undergoing cardiac surgery for some other reason. And then there's a few um, class 2A indications um, uh, so, uh, drop in blood pressure, uh, with exercise testing, um, uh, very severe AS, so peak velocity more than five meters per second, elevated BNP, um, uh, or rapid progression of AS on serial echoes. Um, so those are, uh, potential reasons to, to intervene, um, assuming the patient is, is low risk. And then everyone else um, should just get watchful waiting according to our current guidelines. And I think um, the guidelines I think are, are, are based off of um, this uh, seminal paper by Braunwald um, a few decades ago. We've all seen this graph um, showing you know, a, a latent period for aortic stenosis uh, where you get increasing obstruction you get myocardial overload that just kind of builds until patients develop symptoms. And then suddenly there's a, a drop off in survival. Um, and, and this idea of using symptoms as the trigger for our intervention uh, has, has sort of become our dogma. But this is from the 1960s when most aortic stenosis was rheumatic uh, occurring in younger people. And, you know, so it, it may not really reflect our modern AS population. And then from a practical standpoint, it's, it's hard to gauge when patients, you know, actually reach this, this point of, of onset of symptoms. Um, you know, these symptoms develop gradually and, um, you know, symptoms are highly subjective. So I think this watchful waiting strategy can be tricky and it can make a lot of us uncomfortable. So lately there's been um, growing interest in this concept of doing early intervention in aortic stenosis before the development of symptoms. And the recovery trial uh, was the first randomized control trial looking at this. This was a Korean trial from 2020, looking at early surgery versus conservative care um, in very severe, but asymptomatic 
AS. So they used a, a peak velocity of uh, at least 4.5. Um, and, and the results were pretty dramatic. Uh, there was a, a pretty large um, mortality benefit from early intervention, 1% you know, versus 26% at eight years. Now, this was a, a pretty small study, 145 patients, um, mostly by cuspid valves. 60% um, of patients in this, in this study had bicuspid valves, which, which is kind of interesting. Um, I think when you screen for patients under the age of 80 with very high velocities, you just end up with a lot of bicuspid valves. And then the other thing to point out is stress testing was not routinely performed in this study. So the AVATAR trial that we're talking about today um, it tries to address some of these shortcomings. The hypothesis is early surgery reduces a primary composite endpoint of all cause death and MACE, so acute MI, stroke, or heart failure hospitalization. This was a multi center European trials, so nine different centers in seven different countries. Enrollment was 2015 to 2020. And um, patients were followed every six months for 32 months on average. Uh, the way it worked was this was a, a event-driven trial. So it was conducted until there were at least 35 events. And to be enrolled in the trial, you had to have severe asymptomatic AS. So they used conventional echo criteria, you know, aortic valve area less than one, peak velocity more than four meters per second, mean pressure gradient more than 40 millimeters of mercury. And then everyone needed to have a negative exercise test to prove that they were actually asymptomatic. Uh, they also needed to have a preserved EF and a, an STS score less than eight. These are most of the uh, exclusion criteria. So positive stress test, um, they excluded very severe AS, so people with peak velocity more than 5.5, they excluded uh, reduced EF, dilated ascending aorta more than five centimeters, um, uh, requiring surgical replacement. Um, they excluded people with concomitant valvular disease, so significant AI or severe MR, severe mitral stenosis. Um, they excluded previous cardiac surgeries history of AFib, recent MI in the past year, life expectancy less than three years, severe lung disease, uncontrolled diabetes, GFR less than 30. These things were excluded. And again, everyone got stress testing. And actually 14 patients were excluded uh, based on uh, having a positive stress test, meaning they either couldn't reach their target heart rate or they developed symptoms on the treadmill or they had a fall in their systolic blood pressure more than 20, um, or they had EKG or echo signs of ischemia. Um, so total um, 157 patients were randomized, um, 78 to early surgery, 79 to conservative treatment. People in the early surgery arm uh, we're supposed to get surgery within eight weeks of randomization, although I think there were, uh, there were some delays due to COVID. Um, and then patients in the conservative arm uh, were monitored until they developed symptoms or they had a drop in their LVF to less than 50, or um, they had progress, rapid progression of AS. So you know, their peak velocity increased by more than 0.3 on a yearly basis. There were six people, um, just to point out, six people in the, in the early surgery group that did not actually get early surgery for various different reasons. Um, and these are the, the baseline uh, characteristics. Um, so the vast majority of patients in this study had degenerative AS, 85%. 14% uh, had valves, 1% had uh, rheumatic uh, disease. Uh, there, there, um, 
there was a slight uh, difference in age. So early surgery group had a um, uh, slightly younger population than the um, conservative treatment arm, um, 68 versus 69 um, seems pretty close, but the p-value was actually um, significant. Uh, there was no significant difference in the STS score, no significant difference in the um, severity of AS. Uh, when you look at the ECHO uh, criteria. And um, the, the timing of surgery in the conservative arm um, was highly variable, so ranging from 20 days after randomization to, you know, all the way to um, over three years um, with a median of 400 days after randomization. Um, and in fact, only, only a third of uh, patients in the conservative arm actually got AVR uh, during the, the course of this trial. Uh, the most common reason for people in that conservative group to get AVR was onset of AS-related symptoms. And that includes heart failure hospitalizations, uh, which again is part of the composite endpoint. About half the surgeries used uh, mechanical valves um, a couple patients in each arm um, underwent concomitant cabbage at the time of AVR. And so these are the results. So overall, um, you know, 26 uh, primary endpoint events in the conservative arm versus 13 in the surgery arm. Uh, the, the conservative arm also had twice as many, almost twice as many deaths, 16 versus nine in the conservative arm, uh, in the early surgery arm. Um, and uh, they had a lot more heart failure hospitalizations in the conservative arm. Um, it, it's noteworthy to point out that six of those deaths in the conservative arm were sudden cardiac death at home. Three were related to COVID. Uh, there were three sudden cardiac deaths in the early surgery arm as well. Um, including one patient who was actually waiting for surgery. And then there were several deaths related to um, device complications, PVL, paravalvular abscess. Uh, there was one post-op arrhythmia. There was a ischemic stroke and one hemorrhagic stroke uh, in patients who got mechanical valves. And this is the Kaplan-Meier analysis. So the three-year Kaplan-Meier analysis showed um, a significant difference in the primary composite endpoint in favor of early surgery. The hazard ratio is 0.46. The incidence of all-cause death, heart failure hospitalization, and serious adverse event. Um, you know, these were all lower in the early surgery arm as well, but individually, uh, these differences were not statistically significant. Uh, there was virtually no difference in cardiovascular death. There seemed to be more, um, you know, more uh, repeated MACE events in the um, conservative arm and more bleeding in the surgery arm. Um, but again, these differences were not statistically significant. And there was no difference in the um, post-op LVEF. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve for the primary composite endpoint. Um, you know, you can see that early surgery did better, uh, p-value of 0.02. And then off on the right-hand side, um, again, mortality up top and heart failure hospitalization um, in the bottom right. Uh, these endpoints favored early surgery, but were not statistically significant. So I think, um, you know, this trial, you know, is trying to answer um, a question that, that I think is very clinically relevant. Um, I think essentially we're balancing exposing the patient to the procedural risk or device related complications with early intervention versus, um, you know, risking sudden cardiac death or um, structural damage to the LV with with a uh, more conservative watchful waiting strategy. And this avatar trial is now the second 
randomized control trial that's come out in, in favor of early intervention for severe, for severe AS, um, regardless of symptoms. This expands on that um, recovery trial that we talked about earlier, which focused on more um, uh, very severe AS. I think one of the, the uh, strengths of this trial in particular is the use of stress testing. Um, so everyone uh, had um, stress testing. And I think that you know, for research purposes, that gives us a, a nice rigorous definition of what asymptomatic means. Um, and I think for everyday practice, that's useful as well, because some of these patients will become symptomatic on the treadmill. And, and the other interesting aspect that I think we've seen multiple times is that the latent period for AS can be highly variable. Um, two thirds of patients in the conservative arm of this study uh, never became symptomatic, never got AVR um, uh, throughout the two to three years of follow-up. Um, there's obviously some, some limitations. This is you know, an, another small trial, less than 150 patients. Um, you know, I can imagine it might be tough to recruit patients for um, surgery um, when those patients are asymptomatic. Um, the other thing is, you know, the follow-up time is pretty short here. It's, it's quote unquote multi-center, but actually the vast majority of patients came out of a single center in, in Serbia. Um, and, and just like the, uh, the previous trial, you know, the, this is a relatively young population, people in their 60s. Um, so this early intervention strategy might not apply to older, sicker patients like our TAVR population. And obviously they didn't incorporate TAVR in this study. And then the last thing um, to point out uh, that I think is important is there was no significant mortality benefit in this trial, unlike the previous um, recovery trial. Um, a, a lot of the difference in the primary composite endpoint, uh, it seemed like was driven by more heart failure hospitalizations in the conservative arm. And I think personally that kind of muddles the, the picture a little bit. Um, you know, you're, when you use a composite endpoint that includes AS related symptoms like heart failure, um, then it's, it's not surprising because obviously we're using those symptoms as a trigger for intervention uh, in the conservative arm. So I think, you know, we're just beginning to answer this question of what to do with these patients with uh, severe AS but are asymptomatic. And one idea is, you know, maybe we should uh, risk stratify these patients using different, different data points. Um, and there's different uh, uh, retrospective studies looking at you know, different risk factors, degree of MR, BNP levels, and all these different markers of subclinical LV damage, uh, like diastology and global longitudinal strain, extracellular volume, um, the development of delayed gadolinium enhancement on MRI. You know, these are changes that can start to occur before patients develop symptoms and picking up on these um, theoretically would allow us to be more proactive and also more selective with early intervention. Um, I think the bottom line is we need bigger trials. We need to enroll older patients um, and, and we need to look at TAVR. And th these things are being looked at. Uh, so there's a few uh, large trials in the pipeline looking at, uh, these are all looking at uh, asymptomatic severe AS. Uh, the early TAVR trial has 900 patients, older patients, um, again, they were all screened by uh, stress testing, um, and they're using transfemoral TAVR with uh, the Edwards sapien valve, and they're looking at a composite endpoint. Uh, there's also this uh, evolved trial in the UK, um, estimated to have 1,000 patients, and the, these are all patients with delayed gadolinium enhancement, so fibrosis on cardiac MRI. 
uh, and these patients are getting SAVR or TAVR. And again, they're looking at a composite endpoint. And, and finally, there's this um, Danaver trial, uh, another large study. This is out of Denmark. Um, th this is enrolling asymptomatic patients with high risk features. So um, left atrial dilation or diastolic dysfunction, abnormal strain or elevated BNP. And they're using SAVR or TAVR. And the primary endpoint here is all cause mortality, which again, I think is, is the most um, impactful thing to look at. So we'll, we'll definitely be uh, looking forward to the results of those trials. Uh, these are my references. And uh, with that, I'll uh, open up to any of your thoughts and opinions on this. Thank you, John. Uh, very good. I, I guess my question for, for at this point is based on the available trials and data, um, is there any reason why a low low surgical risk patient would not, you wouldn't just send a severe asymptomatic low surgical risk patient for um, surgery at this point in time? Yeah, I feel like because there was no mortality benefit in this study and, and all we have are these small trials, um, I don't think there's anything strong to argue. You know, I think, I think the jury is still out. Um, you know, if they're, if they're low surgical risk, but they have very high velocities, you know, the guidelines do give a, a 2A indication to go ahead and, and intervene. Um, but, you know, I, I think, again, there's, there's downsides to it. Um, you know, you're balancing that, you know, the, the procedural risk, you're balancing the, um, the device related complications and especially if they're, if they're low risk and young, you know, you have to think about, um, you know, if they're getting a mechanical valve, that's one thing. If they're getting a bioprosthetic valve, you have to think about, you know, what you're going to do down the road for them when their um, valve degenerates. Um, so I think, I think it's still a gray zone, um, especially because, you know, a lot of times it's just hard to tease out whether someone is truly symptomatic or asymptomatic. And that just, you know, muddies the picture even more. So I, I don't know yet if, if, uh, if that patient you're describing should just go ahead and get early intervention. Well, I agree with you for the record. I, right. I, I was just asking, right. Playing devil's advocate, but you're, you're right. I mean, and I, I was referring to, right. A non very severe, like someone with a Valveria 0.9 was, you know, 65 year old, et cetera, but you're exactly right. But I think it's at least worth the discussion, at least worth the thought at this point in time. I think there's, and, and I would not be surprised in the next round of um, guidelines, if that maybe also becomes a 2A specifically for low risk surgical patients, uh, you know, they'll put something at least you know, consider, have the discussion, you know, having a, uh, at least have the discussion with the patient and let them know that it's potentially an option. So, and I see Dr. Dr. Dickert has raised his hand. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, this is, thanks, John. The, the only thing I, I, I'm going to make a, a sort of a picky point um, about saying there's no mortality benefit, right? I mean, I think, you know, the, the study was underpowered to demonstrate a mortality benefit, but there were, you know, 20% that were dead in one arm and 9.5% that were dead in the other. Um, so I think we have to be careful in saying there's no mortality benefit. I think what we could say is in a trial of 100 and, you know, 50, 160 patients, we can't necessarily demonstrate it. Um, and so, so, so I think we have to use that data in, in the way that we can. Um, and, and I think the argument, the, the sort of counter argument here would be you have a, a pretty significant signal um, in, a, in a patient population that I think is, um, that we know is sort of a, a ticking time bomb, right? Um, and so I think that there, there is a sense in which 
I, I, I think it's a, it's a really good question over, you know, how, how, how much trial data do we need to know to believe the signal that we're seeing? Um, and, you know, I think, I, I think it's, I don't think we can say there's no mortality benefit. Um, I think yeah. we can say yeah. a small study. Neil and Stan Sherman. There was also, you know, there was also a sudden death benefit. You know, it did seem like there was twice as many sudden deaths uh, yeah, in that, the conservative arm. That was that was the other piece I was I was going to say is I think you know there's a characterization of all cause death versus uh, cardiovascular causes, but you know for for the most part, I th I think it's pretty. <laughs> As, as Stan is suggesting, it's pretty clear a lot of the people characterize as all cause death. I don't think it's that they had necessarily random events um, that we think are unrelated to their, their aortic stenosis. There are certain kinds of studies where you see all cause death signals that are sort of hard to, excuse me, hard to believe. In this case, I think we have a probably a pretty strong suspicion that these are related to the underlying pathology and not just random events that have no connection. Yeah, I think, yeah, the, definitely the, the six sudden cardiac deaths at home uh, in the conservative arm definitely uh, uh, give us some pause. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be really impactful if one of the future trials coming down the road shows, you know, as, you know, is powered and, and shows a mortality benefit. Um, cause I, I always come back to this composite endpoint and it just, it confuses me this composite endpoint. Cause you're using, you know, you're using heart failure symptoms as, as part of the endpoint. And of course you're going to get, you're going to get that in the conservative arm because that's what you're, that's what you're waiting for. But this is heart failure. Well, think, organizations. It's not just, it's not just the presence of symptoms. Yeah, true. And this is also a population. My guess is they didn't describe it in the paper necessarily, but populations that get hospitalized with heart failure in the context of severe AS probably are not one night, get a shot of Lasix, go home kind of, uh, mm -hmm. kind of folks. Um, so, so I, 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 I don't, there are times I think the composite endpoint is deeply problematic. In this particular case, I'm not so sure it is quite as much, though the issue of confounding in the sense that that's one of the indications for operation is an important point that you raise. I think it was a thoughtful composite and a surprisingly powerful signal as Neil attested to with their difficulty in enrolling in this trial. Um, I would be surprised if this data and hopefully forthcoming data doesn't change clinical practice and guidelines. But I think as you mentioned earlier, the challenge is do we, is it, will it be the best practice as a default to replace valves in everybody who's asymptomatic or will we have a way that's you know, more precise in identifying patients who are at risk? And we've seen this, you know, one of the trials that John mentioned is the early TAVR trial. We are one of the largest enrollers in that trial. Follow-up data is still forthcoming, but hopefully in the next year to year and a half, we'll get some results from that. And just anecdotally, you know, as this one of the centers in the trial, we saw morbidity on both sides of the coin, some TAVR related. Uh, and all the patients that were randomized to AVR got TAVR, uh, and some in the patients that were on the watchful waiting group. They are going to be collecting additional endpoints that, you know, perhaps will shed some light on, you know, personalizing this in a way, but I. The trials that John mentioned, I don't know if there'll be a lot more after that, because my suspicion, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a guess, is that we'll be much more aggressive in replacing valves in these asymptomatic folks. So that the, the opportunity to collect data and, and look at it thoughtfully, I think, is now, it may be more challenging later. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Deverberry. Okay, well... Thank you, John. Very good uh, discussion on an um, important trial, obviously. Um, uh, that, and I agree. I think there's more coming that will probably continue to shape. And I, you're right. I sort of the as the therapy gets better and safer, you you sort of hit the key point to me. I think is that as the 
therapy for aortic valve disease continues to get better and safer and, and lower complication in terms of the, th in terms of the therapy, then we sort of need to keep shifting the, the, the line as to when we recommend the therapy. So, all right, Akanksha, or John, why don't you quit sharing and we'll let Akanksha bring up her screen. All right, our next speaker, someone you all know, Akanksha Agarwal. Gosh, this is at least the second, maybe even the third time she's presented here at Journal Club. I feel like she presents it, many, many of these now. But Akanksha Agarwal, third year cardiology fellow, uh, oh, by the way, to all the faculty, please remember to uh, get your CME credit. Click the blue box in the email from Lori King from yesterday um, to claim your CME credit. But anyway, Akanksha Agarwal, third-year fellow in the clinical track, uh, came to us from Einstein um, Medical Center in Philadelphia and will be headed to Tampa General Hospital um, next year to pursue an advanced heart failure transplant fellowship. And she is going to talk about the popular TAVI trial from New England Journal from, I think it was fall of 2020, if I recall. Yes. Um, and take it away, Akanksha. All right. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So on a similar lines of managing patients with AS, but in a TAVI population, I'm going to talk about uh, the antiplatelet therapy for patients who undergo TAVI. Um, so as reported by the STS ACC registry in 2020, the TAVR volume surpassed the surgical AVR volume. This was like 72,000 versus 57,000. And on the similar lines, how we've been managing patients with intracoronary stents, the initial um, go-to management for patients post-TAVR has been three to six months of dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and Plavix, followed by daily uh, low-dose aspirin. However, the earlier trials back in 2014 and 2017, these were two trials called the SAT-TAVI trial and RT trial. They failed to show any, uh, they failed to show benefit for DAP and demonstrate an increased risk of bleeding. But these were very small trials to draw any firm conclusions from. In addition to that, there was another trial called Galileo trial in 2020, where um, Xarelto rivaroxaban was combined with aspirin and compared with aspirin plus clopidogrel for patients who did not have another indication for anticoagulation, and they saw worse outcomes in terms of increase in death and bleeding. So then comes this, uh, these are the guidelines from uh, ACCHA from 2020, where I would focus on this TAVI section that patients who have a TAVR valve for the initial three to six months, it is recommended, it's a 2B recommendation for patients who are at low risk of bleeding for them to get aspirin and clopidogrel or an anticoagulation itself, an another 2B indication. And then eventually lifelong uh, for all of them to get aspirin, um, low dose aspirin as a class 2A indication. So this trial, popular TAVI trial, it had two cohorts, and we won't be discussing both the cohorts. I'll be only discussing the cohort A, which is for patients who do not have an indication for anticoagulation, who do not have AFib, who do not have other reasons for uh, why they should have um, be on anticoagulation. And in those patients, the trial compared DAPT with the um, aspirin and clopidogrel versus single antiplatelet therapy with low-dose aspirin. The cohort B, just uh, a slide, uh, two slides about that. The cohort B was for patients who did have an indication for anticoagulation, and there they compared anticoagulation alone versus anticoagulation along with uh, clopidogrel for three months. And, uh, for the cohort B section, it was um, well, well, well sized in terms of three one, uh, th about 300 patients. This trial was completed in April of 2020 and was published in NEGM as well. Um, most of the patients had anticoagulation for AFib. The type of anticoagulation that was used was um, about 75 to 71, per 75 and 71 person in, in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the population, only 2% had, two patients had low molecular weight heparin and remainder were DOAC. And they showed uh, that oral anticoagulation alone was associated with fewer bleeding events than um, oral anticoagulation along with clopidogrel. Uh, 
But like I said, we are going to focus on the antiplatelet part, which is the cohort A of the popular TAVI trial. And this is the, this is the paper from NEJM uh, published in October 2020. So this trial was uh, a randomized trial, open label. Um, it was across 17 European sites. They enrolled a total of 690 patients. It was uh, sponsored by this Netherlands Organization of Health Research, but they had no role in, in the execution of the trial or in the analysis of the data. And there was no industrial involvement in the trial. All patients who underwent TAVR and did not have an indication for anticoagulation therapy were included. Patients who received a drug eluting stent in the last three months or had a bare metal stent within the last one month, they were excluded. So that's our initial table for, for this trial where 690 patients underwent randomization. Uh, in both the arms, 12 and 13 respectively were uh, excluded for um, reasons like consenting and failure to screen and all that. Uh, and eventually 331 patients in the, uh, in the aspirin and Plavix arm and 334 patients in the aspirin arm were, were included. Um, it was a uh, modified intention to treat population. So 331 patients or 334 patients were ones which were included, which is um, the, the patients that were enrolled in the trial. The outcomes of this trial, primary and secondary outcomes, primary was one, all bleeding, which was all including minor, major, and life-threatening or disabling bleeding. And the, um, and the other primary outcome was non-procedure related bleeding over a period of 12 months. And you'll see in my following slides, I uh, have put in tables from the supplementary table, supp supplementary index as to how they describe these bleedings. For, um, populate, for the TAVR population, typically uh, something which is called varc VARC definition is used for bleeding stratification. However, the Access site bleeding is not included or it cannot be uh, described as per the VARC classification. And for that, there's another classification called BARC bar classification, which is called Bleeding Academic Research Consortium, which is used to define access site bleeding where, um, uh, where BARC type four is is what is called is what has been labeled as access site bleeding, um, or um, and that will be important just to because the access site bleeding is included as a non procedure related bleeding. Just letting you know. The secondary outcomes uh, were uh, A and B. The A was composite of bleeding uh, along with the, along with thromboembolic events, which consist of death from cardiovascular causes, non-procedure related bleeding, stroke from any cause and MI, and the composite outcome B was cardiovascular, uh, sorry, death from cardiovascular causes again, and stroke and MI. So this is the um, initial table where we compare the demographic characteristics of the uh, population aspirin versus the aspirin plus carbidogrel arm, the age, the um, sex ratio, the NYHA class was pretty well um, stratified between the, both, the, both the groups. Um, the indication for TAVR, as, as we can see, was mostly normal flow, high gradient AS, followed by low flow, low gradient AS, sometimes uh, rarely pure AR and, a, and sometimes a combination of both. Um, the usual CAD risk factors were well balanced between the two groups as well. These are the primary and secondary outcomes. So for all bleeding, which includes major, minor, and life-threatening bleeding, the comparison was 50 patients in the aspirin group versus 89 patients in the, in the dual antiplatelet group with a uh, significant p-value of 0.001. Non-procedure related bleeding, similar 15.1% versus 24.9% uh, with a p-value significant 
towards showing that aspirin was better over DAPT therapy when it comes to um, post-hour uh, post population. Then secondary outcomes, um, they did two types of analysis, non-inferiority analysis and a superiority analysis. And for the first composite secondary outcome, which included the non-procedure related bleeding and cardiovascular death, stroke, MI, all of that, it was um, the secondary outcome was higher in the DAPT arm by both um, non-inferiority and superiority analysis where it received significance for both. However, in the secondary second composite outcome, which did not include bleeding, which was only cardiovascular death, stroke, and MI, there, um, there was no uh, statistically significant difference when going with the superiority analysis. And uh, with the, with the non-inferiority analysis, it did make a significant difference. Looking at the subgroups of these secondary outcomes, um, death uh, was, they, they did not compare them uh, to, to, to uh, mention uh, significance, statistical significance or not. But as we can see, the stroke was um, not, not higher in the aspirin arm. It was, if anything, a little higher in the DAPT arm. And then looking at the VARC bleeding uh, as to which type of bleeding was mostly consisting this all bleeding, it was mostly minor bleeding where 33 and 53 as compared there. And then major bleeding was 17 versus 36 and life-threatening bleeding was nine versus 11. So this is um, a curve showing uh, cumulative percentage of patients with bleeding in the uh, DAPT arm versus the aspirin arm, or let's say aspirin arm versus DAPT arm, and the DAPT arm was higher. Um, this, is, uh, this has been taken from the supplementary index of how they classify these um, bleeding. Uh, this is the VAL Academic Research Consorti Consortium that's, that uh, describes uh, bleeding in a patient with TAVR as uh, minor, major, life-threatening, or disabling. Um, some uh, two, two of the outcomes to note, which were uh, described on the basis of echo finding, was uh, patients patients who um, underwent uh, TAVR, they had an echocardiogram at uh, uh, three month follow up, and uh, symptomatic clinical aortic valve thrombosis occurred in three patients in the aspirin group and one patient in the DAPT group. Uh, an increase in the valve gradient, which was defined as more than 10 millimeter, was observed in 3% of the patients, 10 patients in the aspirin group and 11 patients, which is 3.3% in the uh, DAPT group, which both these outcomes were not um, significant, uh, statistically significant. These are the two um, uh, composite outcomes. Like I said, A was cardiovascular cause death, non-procedural related bleeding and then stroke and MI and composite B excluded the bleeding and only talked about the death and the thromboembolic uh, phenomena um, and MI. And in, in, um, there was a larger difference uh, in, in the outcome between aspirin and DAPT group in composite A, which is pretty well understandably because it included bleeding. Um, in the outcome where uh, we are only comparing death and stroke and MI in, in the secondary composite B. It was a very minor difference from a non-inferiority stand, uh, standpoint, but no major statistical difference uh, from a, from a superior, superiority analysis standpoint. So overall, what we concluded from this trial was that uh, patients who received aspirin in comparison to DAPT obviously bled less. Um, this was their the two primary composite uh, uh, primary uh, outcome events of bleeding uh, and non procedure related bleeding at one year the incidence of severe procedure related bleeding was defined as barc bark type 4 which actually uh, includes intracranial bleeding within 48 hours after a surgical procedure reoperation after closure 
of sternotomy for the purpose of controlling bleeding, transfusion of five units or more within a, 20, within a 48 hour period and a chest tube output of more than two liters within a 24 hour period. So this is how BAR BARC type four, um, type four is being defined. And that was low um, at 1.8% and was only observed in the DAPT group uh, and not observed in the aspirin group. And uh, aspirin alone was non-inferior, but not superior to aspirin plus clopidogrel with respect to the composite of thromboembolic events, which included death from cardiovascular cause, stroke, or MI. There were certain limitations of uh, this trial. One, it was an open-label trial, uh, which means that the uh, part participants uh, know what, what arm they are being uh, assigned to. But however, the trial outcome uh, were analyzed by the clinical events committee where the members were unaware of the trial group assignment. Um, we only looked at, or they only looked at echo findings at, uh, at um, follow-up periods at six months and, and, and 12 months. They did not look at CT imaging to, to detect if patients in the aspirin arm or the DAPT arm were having subclinical valve thrombosis, which eventually after that one year, since the, the follow-up period was only one year, um, so we don't know what, what happens uh, after this one year of uh, um, TAVR intervention. And then, um, like I said earlier, the VARC definitions do not distinguish between procedure-related bleeding and a non-procedure-related bleeding. VARC type 4 definition is what is used for procedure-related bleeding. And since most of the bleeding which did occur at the puncture site did not qualify as VARC type 4, those events are recorded as a non-procedure-related bleeding. Although just when I first read it, I feel like if, if someone has an access site uh, uh, bleeding, that should be procedure-related bleeding. But for all these reasons of defining them and definition-wise, they were classified as a non-procedure-related bleeding and were counted separately. So overall, in summary, what we have right now is that in patients, or this is actually a, a, a table summarizing the antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapy in patients who do who, who, who are post-TAVR and no recent, uh, the patients who have no recent inter intervention and no in indication for anticoagulation, single antiplatelet therapy should be a go-to for them. For patients who have had recent PCI or other independent indication for DAP should get DAP. And the patients who have an ind independent indication of anticoagulation should get a, a warfarin or a DOAC. And that is it. Thank you, Akanksha. Um, so I, I, I guess a couple of things. I won this, this trial confuses me somewhat and maybe someone who understands trial design can, can help with this, but I don't understand why bleeding was the primary outcome in this trial. Like, I don't understand why we need another trial beyond probably the dozens of trials at this point to show us that being on dual antiplatelet therapy is going to increase your risk of bleeding over being on single antiplatelet therapy. I don't understand why embolic, embolic events or valve deterioration wouldn't have been the primary mm -hmm. outcome in this trial. Because I mean, I think that's really, I, I think that's really what you're looking for, right? I mean, you're Correct. looking for increased, and, they, and while they did look at that, I will grant them that they looked at it, but it wasn't the primary design of the trial. It was sort of the, at the end, it's like, oh, and by the way, there's no increased risk of stroke or MI or bowel deterioration, but they don't really, anyway. So uh, that, that confused me. They, I think they just, they were sort of, they did this trial backwards to me from my um, standpoint. And I, then I guess the other question, and maybe this would be for some of our structural colleagues, I, I, I would certainly agree that long-term dual antiplatelet therapy is probably har is certainly harmful from increased bleeding, but what about a short, a 30-day dual antiplatelet and then switching to single, you know, just like a bare metal stent, for example, like treating this like a bare metal stent, you know, just for acute valve thrombosis, that sort of thing, that I know th they didn't show that they weren't really, they were sort of looking at that in this trial, but whether we think that actually might be an option uh, for these patients, a short course, 
of DAPT and then aspirin long-term. So those are my sort of comment and question. Yep, totally agree with your first point, Dr. Williams, that um, it, it is very obvious that DAPT will, patients will bleed more than, than aspirin alone. And this was uh, pointed out by multiple editors later in, in, the, in the NEGM as well, how uh, the actual outcome, which should be maybe valve gradient, thrombosis, valve characteristics, or um, stroke per se was not compared by itself, which uh, also the study was actually not powered uh, in the right way to, to assess the thromboembolic event from stroke by itself. And that's why they uh, most likely did not do the complete statistical analysis. So that is a limitation, one of the limitation of this study. I and think that's one? the point right there is that you showed the numbers in suspected valthrom or documented thrombosis or increased gradient, and they were very similar. So the, the statistical power I suspect you would need to try to tease out a difference would be fairly massive. I mean, mm -hmm. that the sample size would be massive. And I think the question, to answer Ravi's question, you know, when we started the TAVR journey, there was just sort of this default recommendation based on PCI patterns to use dual antiplatelet, but without any real sense of purpose of why we were doing so. And I think this trial did nudge many centers to say, hey, look, you know, now we have some body of evidence to show that, you know, and a lot of it may have been intuitive, but I think we were, it helps to have data to say, look, aspirin is probably fine. We still sort of navigate this in a little bit of uh, anecdotal terms, you know, in the Emory structural heart group, we tend to send our patients out on two baby aspirins instead of just one, you know, and some may argue that the, the data for that, you know, may be limited. Um, but, you know, I think what the, the hot sort of trend now in investigation in the PCI space is de-escalation of antiplatelet therapy and whether we might see studies in that direction with TAVR as well, whether you and maybe even with, you know, there's been some arguments to even use systemic anticoagulation like DOAX maybe for some short period of time to really reduce uh, what may be subclinical leaflet thrombosis. And then at some pre-specified period to then de-escalate down to potentially a baby aspirin or maybe even try to individualize it, whether it's based on imaging or some other uh, markers of, you know, platelet responsiveness. I think there's still a lot left to, um, to tease out in this space. Yep. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Stan Sherman again, good talk. But uh, were all the patients on the same doses of aspirin and uh, whether they were on Dulani platelet or aspirin alone? Yes, so all patients received um, 100 milligram is what was in the in the European I um, and uh, all patients who were not on aspirin before they were first loaded with the um, with aspirin and then continued on aspirin and uh, for Plavix they were also similarly the ones who were not on Plavix before were loaded with 300 of Plavix and then started on the 75 milligram. Um, but uh, all patients were on same dose of aspirin. Some patients required to be on, um, were previously on uh, clopidogrel only, um, and uh, they were added on aspirin, something like that when they were taken into the adapt arm. Uh, but yes, same dose of aspirin. This, yeah, this, uh, go ahead. I was say, this is this is this is Neil. Go ahead. Right, just a very quick question. So, Akanksha, you mentioned the open label design. Mm -hmm. for this one, which um, we have, I think, a sort of default to say that, um, as you mentioned, open label designs are potential flaws. Do do you think? I'm curious. In your view, do you think in this study, is that a problem or not? 
I feel in if um, I mean there is a bias obviously when when the patient the provider both know uh, which which patient is getting dapped versus which patient is getting aspirin there will be um, maybe like a psychological bias towards uh, noting down bleeding noting down uh, the events but uh, the 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 way they said in the paper as well that the analysis committee or the the committee which was actually looking at the results they were totally blinded towards that so I don't think it will reflect in the results. I, I don't think it should reflect on the results, but I am like, I've only maybe looked at few few journal articles and looked at them in, in with that uh, thought process, that open label, uh, how how that would impact. I would be open to um, to hear what you say, Dr. Dickard, about that. No, I raise it only because it comes up every now and then. Um, mm -hmm. I, my view is in this study, it's not a big concern at all um, okay. because the events you're looking at are ones that are all like, you're not going to, if you had a stroke, you had a stroke, right? In general, this is not like, you know, uh, the kind of thing that it's determined by whether you have a placebo or not you. Uh, you're trying to say it's, patient, example, it's not a patient reported event. It's not a, these are all, you know, bleeding is reported, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, so there's some you, you I think you hit the nail on the head, which is just that, you know, is is bleeding the kind of thing that you think is likely to be significantly biased by whether people know their treatment assignment. I think in these cases, the kinds of bleeding they're looking at is not likely to be affected. And most of the other outcomes are ones that um, are not likely to be affected by an open label design. We've had examples of studies where I think an open label design has really caused trouble. Um, and as you say, it really is when the, the when, when when things are triggered by patients reporting of particular events, or especially when symptoms are involved um, that are that are kind of when I say subjective symptoms, I don't mean people fake them or not, but but they're symptoms that people feel. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that I think can trigger treatment pathways that can go very different. We've had some examples of that where mm -hmm. I think open label designs and absence of either placebo or sham procedures have made a really big difference in whether we can interpret the findings. I, I think this is a case where I'm not entirely clear why they did an open label design, because um, it would have been pretty easy to blind people. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think it was necessarily a flaw. Um, and and mm -hmm. I think it, it doesn't undermine the... Um, the data in an, in an important way, I don't think. Got it. Okay, well, uh, thank you to everyone. Thanks especially to John and Akanksha for um, presenting those interesting trials. And thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, look forward to seeing everybody next week for our m and uh, conference for the month of March. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.